My name is John Packer. I'm a professor of law and director of the Human Rights Research and Education Center at the University of Ottawa. Uh, and I'm sitting here in Ottawa within our center. Uh, we're a, a multi and interdisciplinary uh, research and education center uh, committed to uh, the respect and promotion of human rights for everyone everywhere within and beyond the university. As a product of both my studies and some um, elements of life experience, I found, and luck, I have to emphasize luck, I, or, or, or chance rather, or fortune or whatever you want to call it, I found myself uh, at certain points in time serendipitously with, for example, the end of the Cold War. I was, you know, in Geneva, I was working on issues of peace and security and of human rights. And, you know, things changed, opportunities occurred, I was in the right place, right time, those kind of things. Um, but, you know, that now uh, I'm kind of working, my, my professional life has gone the kind of extreme uh, macro level, working at intergovernmental level, uh, structures of capacity building and systems for international peace and security, preventive diplomacy. And so, for example, in the late, in the early 1990s when I started, uh, well, in the 1980s when I started working with the UNHCR and ILO, and a lot of that was about documentation and kind of developing uh, at a period when the norms were still largely being elaborated or their their incorporation into two frameworks of, um, of for example, uh, professional conduct and work plans and things like that, and the structure of the UN, there were virtually no staff members and no budgets and, and so forth. So this is kind of the bureaucracy, the banal aspect of the defense of human rights is um, are, are creating the structures for their defense and the professional cohorts of their defense and so forth. You know, it's very nice to campaign for uh, slogans and so forth, but how you translate that into how we structurally behave in, in political and social terms, organizationally, budgetarily, uh, civil service, you know, and that kind of thing it is a whole other thing. So I started working on that, but in, in the early 1990s, after the end of the Cold War, uh, there was a, a major transition from that into um, really... Uh, you know, does this mean anything, the normative declarations and so forth, in terms of actual conduct? And I don't mean professional competence. I now mean methods of work, actual behavior on the ground. There's always, uh, like almost anything, context. And um, so we have a historical context. Uh, and we have a demographic context, reality. About 4% of the population of Canada, a country of 35 million people, are indigenous. A uh, high degree of, of variety in terms of and, and diversity in their makeup, geographically dispersed, uh, inclusive of Inuit in the Arctic to Cree on the prairies and so forth. Uh, part of that history is a part is a history of consistent exclusion, subjugation, and actually genocide. I use the word unhesitatingly. There are groups like the Iroquois who are virtually wiped out, you know. So um, uh, and 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 not innocently by intent. Yes, the, those populations were and still are subjected to a range of indignities and uh, express human rights violations. So we look at very simple social terms. The, the life expectancy of indigenous peoples is substantially lower than the life expectancy of the rest of the population. Now, connected to that, there's also terrible prima facie violations like uh, murder, mur uh, widespread murder and disappearance of Aboriginal women. Uh, the, stati the statistic, and they're not sure, but I'll give you a figure, about 1,200 Aboriginal women and girls are missing or murdered in the last 30 years in Canada with no explanation. And by the way, across the country. So this is not incidental or one really lousy community. This is widespread. We would call it widespread, systematic and serious violations, life. So that's a pretty serious you know, issue if you're looking at, our, uh, at the situation in Canada. Absolutely. So, you know, the, the, the opposition ranges from uh, the kind of um, uh, total disregard and ignorance uh, in the literal sense. People don't know, people don't care. You know, it's too much trouble. It's far away. All those kind of things out of sight, out of mind. You know, that, that's the uh, uh, which in some senses is, is uh, I don't want to say worse, but it's a pretty bad thing, you know, to uh, uh, degrees of negligence and so forth. Uh, the. But there is increasing, an increasing opposition, uh, which has roots uh, of racism, of um, 
uh, monopoly of truth uh, on some parts, um, various, I, I won't describe them all, where people start to say, bit, fundamentally challenge the premise of human rights and start to say, you know, actually those people don't merit, are not worthy, are less than, they are different. They are not the same as us and they are less meritorious of resources, of time and effort, of justice and so forth. Look, every society has problems. That's why we have things like human rights, to protect, to address the ills, social and, and otherwise. Some of these have historical roots, some of these are social and cultural explanations, but it really, from a victim's perspective and from a human rights defender's perspective, those are context and explanation. They are not justification. So what we then have to do is say, okay, how do we address understanding the context how do we address these things which clearly don't contribute to full lives and dignity and freedom, which is the essence of human rights, Article 1 of the Universal Declaration? Okay, if we say we're for human rights, that's what we mean we're for. We're for full lives and dignity and freedom for everyone, everywhere. Now, when we see it's not the case, you know, whether it's in a suburb of uh, Harlem, uh, you know, or, or whether it's uh, in the Western Canadian Plains, it behooves us, that's why I mentioned Max Weber, to respond, to do something about it. And, uh, and, uh, and we shouldn't, you know, and it's a question about living a moral life, looking out, seeing those things which intersect with us and not, and not ignoring them. You know, part of the offense, part of the indignity, particularly for um, the poor uh, uh, or um, in the case of indigenous peoples in Canada, is to be ignored, is to be basically told their problems are not uh, meritorious. I believe there is a kind of hierarchy. There is a hierarchy of human rights in, in um, logical order. You know, if you don't have, if your right to life is not secure, it's really not a lot of sense talking about holidays with pay, which is another human right. You know, if your right to life is secure and you're not given any holidays and you're at work, you know, then, then holidays with pay becomes really salient. So, but I caution about what's important. You know, I've always told people, it's not helpful to tell a single mother, you know, in, uh, in Reichsweig, uh, who's not got a job and has been discriminated against and is sexually harassed, well, you know, don't worry about it because you're not being tortured in northern Syria. That, that's not an answer to her. And from her perspective, that's still a really serious issue. It doesn't feed her kids. It doesn't give her a life and dignity. Now, of course, the person in Syria you know, they don't need to hear about the woman in, in Reichsweig who, who's, you know, they wish they were that woman. So it all becomes kind of a little bit relative. And, and I caution against it. You know, what, what I would say is that there are certain key insights long ago established and then reinforced, for example, the World Conference on Human Rights in 1993. For example, about the interdependence and complementarity and uh, indivisibility of all human rights. You know, the thing about human rights is they are a minimum standard of inalienable rights. And it's not a matter of picking and choosing and kind of say, don't worry, you're not being tortured, you know, and therefore take the crap pay and no benefits. You know, so from, we know that these things are linked. So there's a few things. First of all, there, you know, you can appeal to self-interest. We have uh, the, the highest population growth of our, of our uh, own population outside of immigration Canada is amongst our indigenous population. Very high degree of youth. These people, young people, are growing up with, a, with inadequate education, with feelings of alienation, with rage. You know, this is not good for our society as a whole. We're, we're going to confront this. We're going to, we are already, we're dealing with it. You know, and it's costing in lots of ways. Forget dignified life, where it's costing in other ways. It's also missed opportunities. Instead of seeing this as a resource of part of our broader society, we're now looking at it as a problem. You know, this, so this, there are various reasons we, we can appeal to the mind. But I would appeal to a, a, a more simple moral proposition, that this is a matter ultimately of ourselves. What kind of society do we wish to live in? Who are we where we accept that 1,200 Indigenous women and girls have lost their lives or are missing, and nothing's happening about it? Who are we uh, to accept that the life expectancy of a substantial part of our population is so much less than the rest. What, what, again, what does that say about ourselves? So for me, there is a question of moral consistency and about the good life of ourselves and a society. And I think if we reflect on that, then we talk about 
what is a better Canada? Yes, Canada is a pretty good country and a lot of people want to come here. And I'm here with my children growing here. And I love my country. It's a physically beautiful, a lot of great people. But we have problems and we can be better. And part of that being better is to be morally consistent and to address those who don't have the same opportunities or have particular conditions that need to be addressed from a human rights perspective. And that is an imperative of a good life. And let me say one other thing about moral consistency. We're also not credible. We are not credible to ourselves or to others if we don't walk the talk. So it's a matter of conduct. And whether we do that locally with our community center or whether we're doing that, you know, in international, I don't know what, it's, it, that's it. Act responsibly, live a decent, coherent life. 